Uh, thank you very much. Well, yeah, it's great to be here, and thank you uh, very much for all coming and, uh, and listening today. You can see our main website up there, creationresearch.net. And yes, Creation Research is the organization that I'm associated with. It's different from Answers in Genesis. It's different from Creation Ministries International, even though we work very closely with some people like Answers in Genesis in the UK. Uh, we have sort of different strengths. In particular, one of the things that we do is a lot of the field trips, a lot of taking people out to see the evidence for themselves. And we actually had a wonderful field trip yesterday, which we'll uh, talk a little bit about later. So our main topic today is climate change. And this is a Sunday morning. We are going to be reading from the Bible. We do want to be getting a biblical perspective on this, as well as dealing with some of the history, as well as dealing with some of the science. But what I thought I'd do to begin with, uh, especially as this is my first time in this church, is give you a, a brief little rundown as to some of the things that Creation Research does, particularly with our museums project and some of the research. Well, there's our logo, creationresearch.net is our main website. We're currently having a big overhaul of all of the websites and everything and sort of condensing it down so that we have lovely research programs that you can read and get involved with. Something that came out of uh, COVID, uh, because this is what we were doing ministry-wise, right? Traveling around and, and visiting churches. And then obviously COVID came and I was stuck in the States, had to try and get a plane back, which was not the easiest thing to do. But we started an online broadcast called Creation Conversations. It features our sort of main uh, heads of creation research around the world, myself, our international director, John Mackay, Craig Hawkins, who's our Tasmanian representative, and also not on this picture, Glenn Wilson. We're all from a scientific or theological background. We have a couple of other researchers who've joined us, and every single week we deal with a different topic. We spend about two hours going in depth into a topic about creation, about design, and we don't shy away from some of the social or political issues of the day as well. Um, last week we dealt with uh, living fossils, this week we're dealing with the origins of life. So I'd encourage you to check out Creation Research on our YouTube channel and our Facebook page. We're currently developing, uh, developing an app which will sort of streamline all of this content as well. But it's also available as a podcast, so you can listen to this all for free, uh, even when you're traveling around and driving or working and so on and so forth. Here's a big part of what Creation Research does. It's our museums project. You can see our main website, but also our UK museum website, thecreationresearchcentre.com. Here is the brand new creationresearchcentre.com, or rather here is the um, done up graphics of the creationresearchcentre.com. This is what the building actually looks like. It's a brand new uh, acquisition for us. We've got about 30,000 artifacts and fossils in our collection. And we're just last year, um, you know, halfway through last year, we managed to acquire this building for the ministry. What is it for? It's for a place of evangelism because we, everybody who comes in through the doors will get the gospel. It's also a place for discipleship. It's to equip and to strengthen Christians uh, all over the country and even around the world through our international programs by showing them that evidence for God's creation is very real. Therefore, evidence of Jesus Christ as creator, sustainer and saviour is real as well. Great exciting things like giant dinosaur jaws. Like I say, we have close to 30,000 fossils and artefacts now. It goes way beyond just the fossils and the natural history side of stuff. Uh, it also delves into archaeology. Some of our biggest examples include these giant fossils, dinosaur footprints, beautiful evidence of flood burial. Flood burial, yes, you've got the curly-whirly ammonites, which are the deep sea creatures. You've got the plant on the um, left-hand side there, which is a living fossil. Those plants are still around today. They're called the southern conifers. But the fact that you've got a land plant and a sea creature buried together means one thing's for sure. This was buried in a flood. Beautiful Jurassic fossil squid. And we spoke about the word Jurassic on our field trip yesterday. Has nothing to do with millions of years of evolution in the slightest. Has everything to do with where these rocks were first studied. Named by Alexander von Humboldt in the 1800s 
after the Jura Mountains in Germany because he travelled the world and he noticed one thing. There was a flood that had clearly buried the rocks in the Jura Mountains just like that previous fossil we saw and just like this squid fossil from the Mulhein in Germany but he realised that this flood must have gone all around the world because you find the Jurassic rocks all around the world as well. So we have great fun with the dinosaurs, great fun with the archaeology, putting all this stuff on display, taking tours around the museum. We also have a fossil and research shop. And the big picture throughout all of this, whether it's the shop, whether it's the archaeology, whether it's the fossils and the science, the whole point that we make is that all things were made by Jesus Christ. The Bible clearly teaches in both the Old and the New Testament that it's Jesus Christ who's the creator. All things were made by the word who is Christ and without him nothing was made that was made. Colossians 1.16, all things were made by Jesus Christ and not only were they made by Jesus Christ, they were made for Jesus Christ and it's in Jesus Christ that everything is held together. So you can find out more about the Creation Research Centre on our website. I'd encourage you to get behind and support the UK Museum Ministry as it really is bringing this kind of research to the forefront. And you'll also see on the table over there, there's lots of free literature, including an ability to sign up to our UK newsletter so you can find out all the kind of stuff that we're doing and getting involved in. I want to share one exciting aspect of the museum project which is really come to fruition in the last couple of years and that's the archaeological side of things. A beautiful Egyptian mummy mask. But the really exciting thing when it comes to biblical archaeology in our museum is this brick here. You see the big brick that I'm holding? It's got some inscriptions written across the middle of it. Now this is actually a foundation brick from ancient Babylon. It was collected by the Reverend Leonard Pearson in the late 1930s, back when it was legal to go to Iraq and collect these kind of things and bring it back. And it actually ended up going on display in the British Museum in London for a while, before the Reverend Leonard Pearson took it back off of loan, and that's how we ended up acquiring it. There's what the inscription is. Beneath the inscription you can see the transliteration, literally putting the uh, Arcadian language into English letters. But that's no good, we need a translation. Well, there's the British Museum's translation on the right-hand side. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, who provides for Eskilo and Isida, eldest son of Nabopolassar, king of Babylon, am I. Now, this is significant for a number of reasons. Number one, it talks about King Nebuchadnezzar. Number two, it talks about King Nebuchadnezzar in the first person. Now, what do we mean by first person? Well, it's that little phrase down there, am I. Now, for years, you could not find any form of inscription that referenced King Nebuchadnezzar that referred to him in the first person. It was always, King Nebuchadnezzar says this, King Nebuchadnezzar declares that. And critics of the Bible said for many, many years that when you read in the book of Daniel about the prayer of Nebuchadnezzar, you know the story of Nebuchadnezzar, I'm the greatest king of all time, in fact, I'm a practically a god. And God says, no, you're not. I'm going to send you mad, send you out to the wilderness. Your hair's going to grow out. Your nails are going to grow out. You're going to eat grass for a while. And at the end of that experience, Nebuchadnezzar said, you know what? I might not be the greatest God after all. And he wrote a prayer, a prayer of Nebuchadnezzar, which if you read in the book of Daniel, is written in the first person. It says, I am Nebuchadnezzar and I say this, God is the greatest of all time, the God of the Israelites. Now, for years, critics of the Bible would claim that there's no way that the book of Daniel could have been written at the time that it was supposed to have been written because no scribe would write down the words, I am Nebuchadnezzar, or Nebuchadnezzar am I, because it would be considered blasphemy. And to a point, they were right. The scribes wouldn't write it down. Because what we've come to realise is whenever you have the phrase, am I, or whenever Nebuchadnezzar is referred to in the first person, it is always King Nebuchadnezzar himself writing or stamping the brick. In other words, two points. Number one, you can trust the Bible. It is an accurate record of what King Nebuchadnezzar himself declared and wrote down. Number two, you're actually looking at a foundation brick, one of the four foundation bricks used in a building that was actually stamped by King Nebuchadnezzar himself. Now that's quite exciting. And you can come and see it in the Creation Research Centre. You've also got these things, little jar handles, which bear the royal seal of the king. Which king? 
Well, these are from the time of Hezekiah, when Hezekiah was preparing for a Syrian invasion, and it says in the book of 2 Chronicles that he prepared storehouses for the storage of grain, for the storage of wine, and for the storage of air, oil, things that would help preserve the uh, cities in case of an attack. These fit in right with the royal Hezekiah period where he stamped these bricks, he got these official stamps on these clay jars to protect them from the oncoming Assyrian invasion. Again, real biblical history, real biblical archaeology on display for all to see. As well, of course, as the fabulous fossils, beautiful evidence of rapid burial, archaeology, history, field trips and much, much more. The other thing that we do big time with creation research is this kind of thing. Take people out on field trips. We had a wonderful field trip yesterday. This was actually one of our first conventions, six days of field trips, six days of going out onto the, into the, you know, into the beach, digging up fossils, coming back, seminars and workshops in the afternoon and evening. This is actually Simon Turpin from Answers in Genesis. He was there with us. We did a joint program together. It was a great time and we got to take people out onto the beach we actually get to take people out and see the evidence for themselves. Here's Dr. Diane Eager, one of our head researchers. She's found a rather wonderful fossil. There it is there. You see the long brown thing? It's some fossil wood. Hey, we found some fossil wood yesterday. In fact, the fossil wood we found yesterday is pretty much the same wood as what's here. It's fossil southern conifer wood. We know that because it's so well preserved. It's part of the Oricaria family. But look at what it's buried next to a curly whirly ammonite. Okay, two points. Number one, no matter how old you want to make the rocks, and according to secular science, these rocks are supposed to be 200 million years old, all you've proven is that in 200 million years, Oricaria pine trees have turned into Oricaria pine trees. They're still here today. But then don't be surprised because 10 times in Genesis chapter 1, God told all living things to reproduce after their own kind. That's the only evidence you can find. But look at what it's buried next to, a deep sea creature. Fossil plants and deep sea creatures buried together is evidence of a flood. It's evidence that the water has come onto the land and washed the trees into the sea, mixed it up with the creatures and buried them quickly. You can see uh, and come and join us on these field trips that we lead all over the country to the south coast. Join us on our big conventions and have a look at what this young lady's found. This is Susie and she's found... Well, it's not quite a curly-whirly ammonite. It's one of the first, most classic living fossils of all time. It's the fossil Nautilus. You can find these fossils on our field trips with us down in the south coast. In fact, this is the first living fossil that was recognised as a living fossil by Charles Darwin himself. And he said these ought to be anomalies. He said that the evidence simply doesn't uphold my theory because my theory is based on the creature's ability to change and yet we don't find evidence of creatures changing in the fossil record. We find evidence of them going extinct, we find evidence of them uh, degenerating, going downhill but remaining the same kind, or we find evidence that for as long as these creatures have been around, they've been reproducing after their own kind. Do pray for Susanna, because since this field trip, she's actually come on board to work with us at Creation Research as an administrator, uh, and uh, it's a big learning curve for her, it's a big learning curve for us, but she's doing really well at the moment, so we'd appreciate prayer for her as she works in ministry and does Bible studies as well. But you can come and join us on these field trips that we do all around the world, and it's all about getting you to get up close and personal to the evidence and actually see the world that God has created from a biblical perspective. Okay, our topic today, climate change, the God who controls the weather. I mean, this is a Sunday morning service, so we really ought to make it biblically based. That's why I've got the God who controls the weather, right? So yes, we will be looking at some science. Yes, we will be looking at some history. But ultimately, for most of us here who are Christians, our biggest question when it comes to climate change should not really be, what's the, a political issue on this? It's, what's a biblical issue on this? What's a biblical point of view? Um, how can we actually deal with these things from a biblical perspective? Now, strangely enough, climate change and global warming is the number one requested topic that creation research have to deal with. Beyond fossils, beyond dinosaurs, beyond anything else to do with creation or evolution, it's always climate change. So as a result of that, we've produced more materials on climate change than any other topic. And we've got more materials on our websites about climate change than any other topic as well. So a reminder, creationresearch.net, click on Q&A, search for climate change. You'll be very blessed 
by the amount of resources there are available on there. Okay, biblical point of view. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. Let this mind be in you that is also in Christ. You see, when we're dealing with things like climate change, when we're dealing with things like global warming, when we're dealing with some of the uh, sort of social political issues of today uh, regarding what is a man, what is a woman, how do we get a biblical perspective on these things? When we're dealing with the question of creation or evolution, this should always be our starting point. We're not going to get to an answer from a biblical perspective unless we start by having the mind of Christ in us, unless we start thinking about the world God's ways. And we have a, a very easy way of doing that because he's actually revealed to us his thoughts in Scripture. He's revealed to us history in Scripture. So to begin with, we need to make sure we have a biblical perspective. We need to make sure that we have the mind of Christ in us. A year ago almost exactly a year ago, we had the Ukraine invasion. And the question that was on everybody's minds was, will Putin start a nuclear war? It's still a question that's on many people's minds today. But just a week after this question came out, um, will Putin start a nuclear war, this was published. Could a small nuclear war reverse global warming? Hey, nuclear warm could be a good thing because you'd have a nuclear winter and that might reverse climate change. It might reverse global warming. Hmm, what's a biblical perspective? And just yesterday, the king co-writes children's climate change book, a ladybird climate change book. Yeah, this is a big deal nowadays. This is a big thing, which is not only in the politics, it's not only in the media, it's also got things that really should challenge us as Christians. Where is the line between looking after the world that God has given us and getting obsessed with climate change? What does the science really say? What is a biblical perspective in all of this? Well, one thing that didn't really reach much media co uh, coverage was just a couple of months ago, this was published. South Pole hits record cold November temperatures. Ah, since records began, it's been the coldest in the South Pole. I wonder when was the last time you heard that. I wonder when the last time you heard that glaciers in the northern hemisphere are growing. Or have you not heard that? Well, we'll have a look at some of these uh, uh, questions as we go forward and some of these reports, but we do need to start with a biblical perspective. So we're going to start with an IQ test, and I want you to get involved. What have the following got in common? Noah at age 602, Abraham when he went to Egypt, Joseph at age 39, Jacob at age 130, and Moses at age 80. Hands up, what do all these things have in common? One theme. No, that's not quite right. It's not when God spoke to them. Not when their ministry started, no. Climate change. Every single one of these instances is a biblical record of climate change. Let's run through them. Noah, at the end of the flood, God promises never to flood the world again. He also promises another thing, that for as long as the earth shall remain, there will be day and night, cold and heat, winter and summer, until the world ends. You see, if you look at your pre-flood world, which originally was a very good world, good well, we view good as a moral word today, and it is that, but it's so much more than that. Because when God said he made the world very good, he described to us what the world was like. He said that animals only ate plants. He only gave them permission to eat plants. Adam and Eve were naked, and they were in the garden, and they weren't getting cancer from the sun, and they weren't freezing to death at night. The climate was very good. And yet, at the end of the flood, you have the first ever record of climate change. From now on, there will be erratic climates. There will be extremities of weather. And Job, which is regarded as one of the oldest books in the Bible, first written post-flood, you have the first ever reference to ice from the north. Now we have climate change. The world has gone from good to bad to, at the end of Noah's flood, worse to down where we are today. It's on a downhill spiral. Abraham, or Abram, well, there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down to Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was grievous in the land. Climate change. In fact, you can actually find evidence of climate change, not just from Scripture, but also from 
the archaeological record, Middle East and climate change, published in secular journals, corresponding with 4.2 to 3.9 BP, that's before present, 2200 to 1900 BC, abrupt climate change to a more arid climate has been recorded. This is secular journalism. Beginning around 4200 BP, sudden demise in civilizations, including Mesopotamia, Canaan, and other Middle Eastern regions. There's your Middle Eastern region. There's what it looks like today. Um, now confirmed by sediment from the Gulf of Oman, Tel Lian in Syria, and Lake Van in Turkey. Ah, abrupt climate change. That actually corresponds with the biblical record of when Abram went to sojourn in Egypt. Climate change in Mesopotamia, not just from the biblical record, not just from the archaeological record, but also from the historical record from literature written at the time. The curse of Akkad. The large fields and acres produce no grain, the flooded fields produce no fish, the watered gardens produce no honey and wine, the heavy clouds did not rain, on its plains where grew fine plants, lamentation reeds now grow. Corresponding perfectly with the time that from both the biblical record, the archaeological record and now the historical record all show climate change in the Middle East. It's now quite clear that after a period of a humid and warm climate, and that's a key point there, remember that, we're coming back to that later, the precipitation greatly diminished after 4,200 years BP, before present, in a littoral zone of the eastern Mediterranean. Numerous sources confirm this. Abraham went to Egypt because of a famine. Why did Joseph go to Egypt? His brothers sent him there. But what happened while he was there? Seven years of plenty, seven years of drought. That's why Jacob went there, because the land of Canaan was in a drought. There was a famine in the land, climate change had happened once again, and Jacob had to remove himself from the land of Canaan to the land of Egypt. In fact, we were at the British Museum just a few days ago, looking at evidence of the biblical patriarch Jacob inside of some of their Egyptian displays that they have there. It's fascinating, maybe we can mention that later. But all of this was happening because of climate change. All right, another question, why Egypt? What's the obsession with going to Egypt? Abram, Abraham, Joseph, Jacob. Well, a little bit of a clue can be found in Matthew chapter 2, related back to Hosea chapter 11, out of Egypt I call my son. Ah, the biblical story of salvation is still going on even way back at the time of Abraham, Jacob and Joseph. But then don't be surprised because the salvation plan was written in from the beginning of the world. Before the foundations of the world, Christ was slain. Jesus Christ wasn't plan B. It wasn't God going, oh no, now what am I going to do? It was destined to be this way from the very beginning. And the wonderful message of salvation is woven down throughout history. Moses, well... Why did Jacob and Joseph come out of the land of Canaan? Because there was a drought, it was a famine, climate change. What about the time a few hundred years later when Moses was going to lead the promised uh, people into the promised land? Well, it was a land flowing with milk and honey. Milk, goats, cows, livestock, good grass required, good climate required. Honey, bees, flowers, good climate required. The climate had changed from a desolate, dry, barren area, which was producing a famine in the land at the time that Jacob had to go to Egypt, to now when the children of Israel are heading back to the promised land, it's a land flowing with milk and honey. Ah, get a big biblical perspective. Now, there's no way we're going to deal with every single issue in climate change. We have about four or five different presentations. We have three productions, uh, four productions rather, sorry, uh, just on climate change, DVD-wise and books and all sorts of stuff. So a real great resource is the Creation Fact File. So go to creationresearch.net, click on Fact File, stick in climate change. There's tons of information on there. But what's the real issue we're dealing with here? Well, these are the questions. Who is your authority? Who has the right to decide? Who actually has control of the weather and the climate? And who is sovereign over all? Me and my wife spent four days interviewing members of Extinction Rebellion for our fifth production on climate change, which we're currently working on, interviews with scientists from all over the world, but also interviews with those who are part of Extinction Rebellion, the climate change activists. Rebel for life. The rebel for life? The question is, who are they really rebelling against? What's really going on here? Well, there's one thing that's abundantly obvious when you speak to these people. They are certainly worshipping a creation. 
the creation. They are worshipping the world. They are putting the world up there at the same value as other things. Well, the Bible speaks about this, Romans chapter 1. They did not glorify God. They did not thank God. They became futile in their speculations. Their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and served the creature or the creation rather than the creator. Now, what does the book of Romans say will happen if you do these things? Simple. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions, exchanged the natural use of their bodies, burned in homosexual lusts, committed what is shameful, and in verse 32, such things are deserving of death. Ooh, harsh words. Not my words, thankfully, but the scripture's words, the Bible's words, God's words, revealed inspiration uh, in scripture. Worship the creature? The logic is simple. Those that worship the creation rather than the creator will be given up to evil. Those who worship the creation deserve to die. Ooh, really harsh words. Blunt words, straight out of scripture. But then before some of you who perhaps don't go along with the climate change thing start going, well, I'm so pleased that I don't do that, just remember that there is none who does good, no, not one. All have fallen short of God's glory. All have sinned but all who believe are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. You see, the core issue with this that we're dealing with, we need to have our focus as a mind of Christ. We need to have our focus on the gospel. We need to understand where these people are coming from. We need to understand what the science says. We need to understand what the history says if we're ever going to get a big biblical picture. So, 2020, me and my new wife, joined together um, and went to Iceland for what is technically our honeymoon. We uh, got married in the height of COVID two days before the law of six came in or the rule of six came in. So we managed to just have our 30 people. Um, It's a very long story about how we got together and ended up getting married, but it's a real blessing uh, or real blessed story. But we decided to have a few days sort of on our own in the UK, but we always wanted to travel. And the only place that was really opening up Uh, are sort of in the middle of COVID still really uh, in October 2020 was Iceland and so we said right we're going to Iceland it was cheap flights there was hardly anybody there it was great time and halfway through this honeymoon I said you know what dear it would be such a shame to waste this opportunity we really ought to film a documentary and so we did and so we did we ended up actually producing Land of Fire and Ice the real history of climate Um, hmm, from a biblical perspective and it's great because most of our uh, resources on climate change are sort of lectures like this this is actually filmed on location in Iceland in the UK and in Australia now uh, I did give my wife a proper honeymoon before that just before anybody gets upset about that but she loved this she comes from a media background she's a filmmaker and so it was a real blessing to be able to spend some time actually doing some research and filming this and a little bit of this science and history side of things is going to be based off of this production land of fire and ice because it really is rather fascinating you see when you go to iceland as we did you get to hike up glaciers beautiful place to go and explore and walk but they have a really good tourist board there and you have signs bilingual signs all over the place that you can pull up and read and places like this in the Vatnajökull national park which is one of their big volcanoes there which has got a big glacier on top of it they teach you things like this global surface temperature has increased by one degree centigrade on average since pre-industrial times and considerably more in the arctic that's the claim what's the evidence for this claim Well, there's actually quite a lot of evidence for this claim. Have a look at the results. 1935, a large glacier that sweeps down over Vatnajökull. 2015, it's retreated rather significantly. Yes, there's no denying that the glaciers are melting. You can see this all over the world. The one in uh, Switzerland in 2006, a glacier which runs down the side of the mountain. In 2018, it's all but disappeared. However, there is certainly evidence of global warming. There's evidence that the temperature is going up. How significant is that? That's the number one question. Number two question, what is actually causing it? Because the second point that these tourist boards make all the time is that the cause of global warming is anthropogenic, which is man-made emissions of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases due to 
the combustion of fossil fuels, power plants, transportation and industry, decreasing the uptake of CO2 by deforestation and agriculture. In other words, the prevailing claim, not just in Iceland, but also in the media, in the news, in uh, things that you see in politics, is that climate change, global warming, is man's fault. It's a direct result of man's interaction. That's what the claim is. That's what we need to dig down into deeper. Well, we actually got to explore some glaciers while we were out in, uh, in Iceland, and you can see us climbing up a glacier and seeing some of the evidence of how far it has actually retreated. But one particular glacier in Iceland really hit the media in 2019 and we actually travelled in 2020 to go and see this very glacier. Extinction of glaciers in Iceland, BBC News. Iceland's Okjokol Glacier commemorated with a plaque. Mourners have gathered in Iceland, they said, to commemorate the loss of Okjokol. The glacier was officially declared dead in 2014 when it was no longer thick enough to move. Okay, there's the claim. Where's the evidence? Here it is, September 1986. A large glacier on top of a mountain and in the middle is the crater. By August 2019 that glacier has pretty much disappeared. They've renamed the mountain Ok uh, in memory of its glacier but the glacier really is no more. I know that, I visited there, we climbed up to it. However, what was interesting is the reporter, the Icelandic reporter who wrote this BBC News article said this, 150 years ago, no Icelander would have bothered the least to see all the glaciers disappear as they advanced over farmlands and flooded whole areas with meltwaters and streams. What does that tell you? It tells you 150 years ago, these glaciers were growing. Now they're melting. There's been a climate change, for sure. Okay, one step further. Mourners have gathered in Iceland to commemorate the loss of Okjokol, which has died at about the age of 700. The glacier was officially declared dead in 2014 when it was no longer thick enough to move. Question, how do they know that it died at age 700? It's a simple answer. The Vikings were there when it was born. They observed the glaciers coming onto the land. They wrote about it in their sagas. They documented what the climate was like when they arrived on the island in the form of the food that they could grow, in the form of the farming that they could do. They documented when the glaciers came onto the land. And in one particular saga, it talks about how cold the climate had suddenly got that they actually had to eat dogs to survive and throw the older people off of cliffs because they couldn't keep them alive anymore. You see, this is a glacier that was born in the 1300s, died in the 2000s. Ah, climate change. Cold to be born, warming back up again to melt. Iceland's major glaciers have all expanded in the last 12 months, says the University of Iceland, and are expected to continue. Published 2018. Where was that in the media? You see, there is certainly fluctuations. There's no doubt that over a larger period of time, say a few uh, decades, these glaciers have been melting. But there is a fluctuation in them for sure. There is a cyclical term to climate change. Major Greenland Glacier is growing. Jakarsvan Glacier has grown for the third year in a row and scientists attribute the change to cool ocean waters, say NASA. These are all very legitimate sources, but very rarely actually hit the media. There's Jakobsvarn Glacier in Greenland. It's growing. That entire new arm was grown just a few years ago. Ah, ocean warming warning. 31st of October 2018 in Nature, highly prestigious journal. An article was published, quantification of ocean heat uptake from changes in atmospheric O2 and CO2 composition. Now that's a long and complicated title. The claim overall throughout the entire paper was that oceans were warming at a greater rate than previously believed and this was because of man-made climate change. That was the argument. It got widespread media coverage and ocean warming report in the BBC, in many of the big American uh, newspapers and news sources, in some of the big Australian news sources. However, within days of the Nature publication, statistician Nicholas Lewis found serious errors with the calculations. And actually, there were no greater ocean warming rates than previous estimates. How long did it take for Nature to uh, add a retraction? almost an entire year, a tiny little subnote in the bottom of the journal. How much news reporting or coverage do you think he got? Absolutely none whatsoever. 
Ah, you've got to be careful sometimes. The Bible tells you to test everything, only hold fast to what is good. We need to be testing all things because there are errors that are put out there which get clung on by the media and promoted as fact. If you really want to get a biblical perspective, you have to start at the beginning. In the beginning, God created perfection. In the beginning, God created. He created man in his image, and he created a world that was very good. And he didn't just leave us hanging with trying to work out what good meant. He told us what good meant. Good meant that all creatures were vegetarian. Good meant there was no winter, summer, no drought. Good meant the climate was good. It was the perfect climate to sustain all of life. We need to get the big perspective. So what does the history of Iceland look like? How can we correlate the history of climate in Iceland with climate elsewhere around the world? And how do we tie that into a biblical perspective? Well, let's have a look at Iceland's climate past. My background is geology, specifically paleobiology, right? We look at fossils. We dig up fossils and try and work out how these creatures lived. So let's have a look at Iceland's climate past. On the top, you can see the volcanic rocks. Most of Iceland is volcanic. There are a few little fossil deposits, uh, but most of the island is volcanic. In fact, the um, Mid-Atlantic Ridge almost cuts directly up through Iceland. Lots of volcanic rocks. Beneath the volcanic rocks, you have red fossil soil. Now, I recognise what this red fossil soil was because I'd seen this red fossil soil elsewhere. This is called laterization. What is laterization? Well, this is the stuff in uh, Iceland. Where else had I seen it? In the deserts of Australia, down in places like Mount Archer. There's the red fossil soils called laterization. The red is due to iron from a hot, wet climate. You see, laterization can only happen if you have a hot, wet climate where you have the clays and the soil mixed together, leach out all of the iron from the clay and sit it in the soil. It's a record of a past climate. It's a, that's why we call it a fossil soil. It's a record of something from the past. It's a record of warm, wet climates. Now, neither the deserts of Australia or the wastelands of Iceland are warm and wet today. They're either warm or they're wet, but they're not both. You see, climate has certainly been different in the past, both in Iceland as well as in Australia. And you can actually go to the Iceland Museum up in the West Fjords and you can find fossil plants on display in there from a very special location that we were able to actually go and visit ourselves and dig up and collect some. Lots of fossil plants from Iceland, from Iceland's history. Fossil plants with things that you may recognise. Names like the birch. And you might recognise that as a birch leaf. Hey, it's a living fossil for sure. And in the uh, museum, they have this statement, what was the climate like here? And they tell us most trees making up Icelandic fossil forests are now extinct. However, closest relatives now thrive at more southern latitudes in tropical and subtropical coniferous forests. In fact, they say both the fossil and the pollen evidence suggests a humid, warm temperature conditions of an average temperature of up to 15 degrees centigrade. Now, to put that into perspective, the UK's average temperature is about nine and a half to 10 and a half degrees centigrade, right? Because it's an average. 15 degrees centigrade puts you up there at an average similar to the south of France, right? Mediterranean climate, tropical to subtropical. But then don't be surprised because you have evidence all around the world that soon after the flood, it was warm and wet, almost globally. And then the climate changed. When did the climate change? About the same time that Abraham had to go and sojourn in Egypt. Because you find evidence not just in the Middle East, but also as high up as Iceland, of a climate change from a warm, wet environment to now erratic climates, extremities of climates. In fact, we actually have some of these fossil leaves in our museum collection. I actually brought them along with me today. We have some uh, fossil leaves, uh, sort of like a whole mulch mat of fossil leaves, which we collected from Iceland and was able to bring back home with us. So we have some here if you would like to be able to come up and see them. Iceland's climate past, at one point it was Mediterranean. At one point it was subtropical, with an average temperature of 15 degrees centigrade with plants that are essentially modern. Then you have an ice age. Almost the entirety of Iceland is covered in glacier. But a few hundred years later, the Vikings arrive. 
They grew cereals and they farmed, things which are very difficult to do nowadays. They documented a warmer climate. In fact, we can get all of this information, all of this individual records from Iceland's historical uh, record, from the, the climate record of the past, and put it into a biblical perspective. You have a tropical to subtropical condition soon after a global flood. The temperature plummets due to an ice age as a result of a global flood, but it warms up again for the Roman warm period, which we find correlated in places like the United Kingdom. It cools down again, but warms up by the time the Vikings arise, and it gets cooler at the time of which is referred to as the Little Ice Age. But notice that the climate in Iceland today, which is an average temperature of three and a half to four degrees centigrade, depending where you are in the north or the south of the island, is nowhere near the climate that it used to be back when these plants were growing. In fact, a few years ago, before the University of East Anglia's uh, climate chart basically took over the media, this was published by the University of Leeds. Central England temperature since 900 AD from historical records. You notice one thing, the climate's gone up, the climate's gone down, and the climate's coming back up again. You see, this is referred to as the medieval warm period. It's now something which is generally recognised as a phenomenon that happened almost globally. A warm period time when you were able to have much, much better crops, where you were able to have much better climate. Whereas by the time you get to 1303, the Baltic Sea freezes, the first record. By the time you get to 1315, massive floods across Northern Europe, which were likened in documents uh, to be like Noah's flood. Now, obviously not on a global scale, but it just gives you an idea of the severity of these floods. Interestingly enough, in 1610, Galileo Galilei discovers sunspots. What are sunspots? They're cool patches of the sun. Now, the more cool patches of the sun you have, the hotter the sun is as a whole. Ah, I wonder if sunspots have anything to do with climate change. But you find it in the archaeological record of the UK as well. And again, in Fire and Ice, we actually travel to this abandoned village and go and explore it. We're down in Dartmoor, in an abandoned medieval village. It was founded soon after the Norman Conquest. It was abandoned in the 1400s. Why? Because of cold. It got to the point where it was too cold for them to survive as the United Kingdom and most of Northern Europe ended in, entered into the Little Ice Age. They had to head for the towns because they couldn't survive in the middle of Dartmoor anymore. Now it's warmer. It was a beautiful summer's day when we visited. Ah, up, down, up, down. And ever since they discovered sunspots, we've been recording the number of sunspots. And between 1645 and 1710, we've noticed a dramatic decline in sunspot numbers. Well, don't be surprised because we're now in the grip of what is referred to as the Little Ice Age. A place where the Thames would freeze over. A place where it would be absolutely cold for many years. And during the Little Ice Age in 1695, there was no open water in any direction around Iceland. Ah, a climate change, a change in climate. Long before carbon emissions or anything to do with what might, uh, is claimed to cause climate change today. In fact, in the Thames freezes in 1677 for the first record, in Venice in 1707 you have a similar thing. Frozen lakes, frozen canals where you can go skating over them. And in 1814 you have the last frost fair on the Thames and the climate has been on the up ever since. But note one thing. It still hasn't got to be back as warm as it was during the medieval warm period, according to Central England temperatures. Ah, a published a few years ago, December 2009, Met Office predicts warm winter, but the Daily Telegraph said, we recommend you get your woolies out now. Now, I'm not saying you should listen to everything that the Daily Telegraph says, but this was actually some good advice, because January 2010, that picture was taken from the satellite. Do you remember Snowball Britain? really cold, water, snow absolutely everywhere. Ah, you should be careful of believing some of these media reports sometimes because things can happen at a snap. And in fact, Timothy, Paul warns Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6, avoid profane and idle babblings, contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. By professing it, some have strayed concerning the faith. In fact, if you read your old King James Bible, the word for knowledge there is the word science, because science is the old Greek word for knowledge. Beware of false science, beware of false knowledge, Paul is warning Timothy, it will lead you astray. Yet yeah, the evidence is that the climate has gone up, 
the climate has gone down, the climate has gone up, the climate has gone down. In fact, you can go back even further um, to the Romans. In fact, you can go back even further than that. In fact, if you want a full perspective of UK history, it's the first humans are evidence that humans arrive in the UK. We have evidence of a warm and wet environment. We have evidence of human settlements and footprints in places like the Norfolk coast where you are buried in peat beds that are almost sort of, again, subtropical. A uh, lovely warm temperate climate. Then on top of these you have glaciers. The world had gone cold. Ice had covered the world, certainly in the high northern hemisphere. Skip forward and the Celts are wearing skirts. It's warming up again. In fact the Romans brought over Mediterranean grapes from Italy and grew them as far north as the Scottish borders. Now it's tough to grow grapes in the UK. It is possible but most of them are either grown under polythene or they have been specifically bred to cope with our cooler climate. These are Mediterranean grapes which are being brought over and grown as far north as the Scottish Isles. In fact the general, um, the Roman general Arigula actually said hey this look at this Scottish border area this place here in northern England northern Britannia the place is wretched with its frequent rains he said said but it's not cold the soil will produce good crops in fact throughout the British uh, the Roman occupation of Britannia we were referred to as the bread basket of the Roman Empire because we were so good for growing crops skip forward and the Vikings also grew grapes this time not as far north as Scotland but in York Jorvik the uh, historical Viking site near York you'll find that by the time you have the height of the medieval warm period um, you've got entire cathedrals and churches which are being built without fireplaces. Interesting cultural bit of history, because they didn't need it. It was warm. However, by the time you get to the 16, 17, 1800s, you have party on the Thames because we're in the Little Ice Age and it's frozen over. Today, we have Greta Thunberg telling us you need to buy a special light in order to save the planet. You see the his real history of climate? Up, down, up, down, up, down just as God promised that it would be. Now, one of the things, one of the reasons I've taken this tact with us today, because you might have questions more specifically about the science or about the history, and we have entire programs about that. But the big thing here, which I'm speaking to most people here I know are Christians, and this is the real big thing. It's about getting a biblical perspective. It's about getting a full perspective in light of the Bible. So to finish, we're going to read from 2 Kings chapter 3. If you do have your Bibles, I'd encourage you to open it up there. 2 Kings chapter 3, verse 6. And we're looking at evidence of a God who is control of the weather. We're looking at evidence of a God who is sovereign over all. 2 Kings chapter 3, starting in verse 16. Let me put it into context for you. The kingdom of Israel, the good king Jehoshaphat, and the Moabites are invading. They have held the city siege and they are starving them to death. They have no water. They have no food. They need a miracle. And King Jehoshaphat does the right thing, being the good king that he is, one of the few good kings that the kingdom of Israel had. He turns to God. What does God say? And thus he says, this is verse 16, Thus says the Lord, make this valley full of ditches. For thus says the Lord, you shall not see wind, nor shall you see rain, yet that valley shall be filled with water, so that you, your cattle, and your animals may drink. This is a simple matter in the sight of the Lord. You will also, he will also deliver the Moabites into your hand. This is a God who is control of the weather. He had told the kingdom of Israel to, out of faith, dig some ditches. And you won't see rain, you won't see a storm, you won't see a river, you won't see the normal things that bring about water in terms of a climate. But in the morning, what's going to happen? The ditches are going to be full with water. This is a God who came to the earth as a man who was on a boat in the middle of a stormy sea, stood up and said, peace be still, and there was instant climate change. This is a God who is in control of the weather. It's not just a God who has promised us that there will be changes in climate going forward. It's a God who has instructed us, first and foremost, to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ to all nations. Now, my challenge to you is that, number one, that should be our focus. Number two, 
a lot of times issues like climate change, global warming, stuff like that become very distracting for a lot of Christians from what is the real important issue. The real important issue is that the same God who controlled the weather when he delivered the Moabites out of the ha or delivered the children of, Israel out, children of Israel out of the hands of the Moabites uh, or delivered the Moabites into the hands of the children of Israel is the same God who stood on the boat and said peace be still and he's the same God who has promised he will come back again and give us some real global warming the world will be burned up in fire right that's the global warming we ought to be concerned about not us personally as Christians but what we should be actually spreading the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ because hey real global warming is coming that's where our priorities should lie you see this is the God who is sovereign over all it's the God who has promised us there will be changes in climate for as long as the earth shall remain seed time harvest cold heat summer winter he's the one who is actually in control of the weather because well, what happened at the time i mean there's so many examples we could use not just from the moabites and the children of israel but also from the prophet elijah i mean what did elijah say to the uh, to the king and to jezebel king ahab and jezebel did he say hey i'm going to pray that god's going to send lots of lovely blessings of good weather no he said i'm going to pray for drought boy is that a popular prophet <laughs> I'm going to pray for drought. This is a God who can actually turn on the taps like that and turn off the taps, and he did. He turned off the taps and the entire kingdom of Israel went into a drought. And what happened when the god Baal was destroyed and the altar of the Lord went onto fire as Elijah was running behind the chariot? Rain started to come. You see, we need to, not only as a group of Christians, but also really as a nation, as an entire people group, we need to turn back to the Lord and say, Lord, have mercy on us, a sinner. Right? Because it is ultimately that focus that we need to be on, the focus of spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. So you might have questions about some more about the science or the history, but what I've tried to do today is really give you that starting point, really give you that biblical perspective. Again, I would encourage you to uh, watch Fire and Ice. It delves a lot more into the history and the science, and again, it's unique because it's not just a stand-up lecture. We actually travel the world and show you what the evidence really says. There's two other... Um, resources at the back there uh, the 2020 God's Eye view of climate and change that deals very heavily with the science climate change the God factor deals again with the biblical authority side of stuff and there's also uh, which we don't have available today but it's available online uh, climate change a really inconvenient truth which was our first ever production about climate change right after Al Gore published An Inconvenient Truth. We published A Really Inconvenient Truth. And again, it goes back to God being sovereign over all. Um, a reminder before we finish, we do have a whole load of resources and books, including a brand new devotional, Hot Off the Press. This has only been available for a week, Loving Her, Loving Him, which is a series of devotionals by John Mackay after uh, 50. 55 years of marriage he's uh, imparted some of his wisdom which i personally found very very useful and for all the uh, families here and for the adults as well uh, we have this is a brand new series the rocks cry out charmouth and black Ven. it's actually one that i produced it's how i met my wife so it's very close to my heart but it's actually produced in order to help you have field trips to different places all over the country and bring it not only a bit local so it tells you where to go maps and everything else but it also gives you all the geology in perspective and the concepts which are written in these books are pretty much able to be applied anywhere we applied the same concepts on the field trip yesterday so it's well worth having a look at some of the books and the resources and the dvds up the back a reminder creationresearch.net click on to the fact file click on to climate there's a whole wealth of information on there that we if we don't get chance to deal with stuff in the q a session today i'm going to hand back to uh, to matt now and uh, have some questions and answers.